This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Samantha Bennett with the K-State Radio Network. K-State graduate student Lily Wadashevsky joins Agriculture Today to discuss her research evaluating the ability of cover crops to suppress weeds. She emphasizes that while cover crops can serve as a tool, utilizing other weed suppression protocols in conjunction with cover crops will lead to better outcomes. Also ahead, Justin Wagner, K-State Extension Beef Specialist, joins us to share information on an upcoming unique opportunity in Garden City. He highlights the upcoming 30-hour OSHA general industry course that will be taking place over March 31st, April 14th, April 28th, and May 12th. We'll undoubtedly see some insect pest problems this spring and summer. However, it may not be necessary to use pesticides to control each and every one. We end today's show with K-State horticultural entomologist Raymond Cloyd discussing alternative control methods. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. We are joined now by a K-State Agronomy Master's student. Her name is Lily Wadashevsky, and she's joining us today to talk about some of her research during her master's program here at K-State, really focusing on cover crops as a tool almost to suppress weed growth. So before we get into things, Lily, thank you so much for joining us today. Yes, thank you so much for having me, Samantha. I'm excited to be here and talk about some of the research that we have put together. So Absolutely. Well, we're happy to have you. And like I mentioned, your research has really revolved around the implications of cover crops and kind of the benefits they can add and specifically the benefits of maybe mitigating some of the weed issues that we see here in Kansas. But tell us a bit about your research. It's spanned across several different states here in the north central region of the U.S. Yeah, for sure. So the research that we put together is really revolving around how cereal rye as a cover crop is impacting the soil seed bank, specifically with Palmer amaranth and water hemp. So we had research conducted all across the north central region. So the states that we had involved was North Dakota. Uh, We had two sites here in Kansas at Rossville and Manhattan. Uh, We had two sites in Wisconsin, one site in Missouri, and one site in Indiana. So what this research did is we had two different treatments. So we had cover crop, which was cereal rye, and then a no cover crop treatment. And uh, we took populations from all of the states that I just mentioned there. And uh, we basically mimicked the weed seed bank and were able to bury those seeds in a way that was replicating how they would normally be within the soil there. And this research was conducted so far over a year and a half. So um, we buried these seeds within our treatments, so cover and no cover. And uh, we buried those in the fall of 2020. And then we had different removal times to see how seed viability was over over time is kind of what we were looking at. So if we are implementing cover crops more and more, if there's any differences over just having one year cover crop versus multiple years of cover crops. So um, we buried those seeds in the fall of 2021 and then uh, we removed them at soybean planting time in the springtime of the following year and then um, also at harvest time. And then we have another removal time coming up here at spring soybean planting of this year. So we only have two removal times that we've had the opportunity to look at. And what we've kind of found there is that with cover crop treatments, we actually had increased seed dormancy. So what that means is when we remove those seeds, they were still viable. Uh, They just had not had the chance to germinate in some of those cover crop treatments. And that can be a good and a bad thing for farmers. So basically a dormant seed means that we're just going to have to control that seed later on in the year, whether that be that same growing season um, or the following year, that weed is still going to be an issue for farmers. However, it could be a good thing. Generally with Palmer amaranth and water hemp, we see a pretty steep decline in natural longevity of those seeds around two to three years is when we see the viability really taper off in some of those populations. So if we were able to use cover crops um, to increase dormancy until we hit that two or three year mark, that can be a good thing to see possibly if those seeds could could naturally become non-viable at that point in time. Um, But we really don't have enough data points uh, to be able to say if we can push dormancy that long or if they're just going to be an issue for farmers that next year um, or later in the season. 
And also with some of our populations, so two of the seven populations that we looked at also had a increase in viability. So with those cover crop treatments, uh, we did see increased viability of two of the seven populations that we looked at, which isn't what we want to hear, um, where their cover crops provide us a lot of benefits from a number of different standpoints. But this data is also important to make sure that we're relaying this to farmers to maybe say that cover crops aren't going to be a, an end-all tool for weed suppression um, from that aspect anyway, that we may need to be using other tools in our toolbox. However, that that is very good data to be able to provide a basis for future research as we kind of look at what factors of those populations contributed to higher viability in those cover crop treatments. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And you mentioned you're pretty much a little over halfway through your research here. So there's still some data to still be collected this following season when you're taking that data back. So hopefully we'll be able to hear more about if that dormancy continued and if that seed viability decreased like you're hoping it will. But when it comes to the data that you have had, you mentioned those two populations that were a little bit more viable. What, mm-hmm. what made the difference there, do you think, in those populations versus the other five? Yeah, that's really interesting. So the two populations that we observed that with was Indiana water hemp and uh, Missouri water hemp. So those two populations, something unique um, within those, some sort of genetic factor, I'm assuming, is what's contributing to that. We don't know. We haven't dug that deep into it or have enough data points to be able to say what is truly causing that. But likely it's going to be some impact um, with with something special to those populations uh, that's interacting with those cover crops in a unique way. So we don't know exactly what's causing that, but we do know it's something specific to those populations so far is what our research is showing some good insight there for sure on those two specific areas. And you also mentioned that cover crops are a great tool that have many various benefits and that, you know, weed suppression is one of the things we hope to prove it helps with. But it's it's also just a tool in the toolbox, like you said. So when it comes to pairing cover crops with, say, some other weed management tools that are possible, what kind of couples, in your opinion, best with cover crops in that situation? Yeah, no, for sure. Just looking at some other herbicide programs that we generally like to implement. So looking at cover crops, we know from previous research that the more cover crop biomass that you have out in the field, generally you're going to see an increase in weed suppression, which is a good thing. So if you have your cover crops out there, make sure you're getting the most out of them, maybe waiting a little later to terminate those cover crops. And and that can have some other implications as well from um, just a crop production standpoint. But if you're looking strictly at weed suppression, that's generally what we like to see is more biomass is going to be mean more weed suppression. Uh, using some of the herbicide tools that we have out there as well. And then obviously tillage is going to play a factor in that. So making sure you just whatever's fitting on your operation that you have available to you, just making sure that we're using an integrated weed management approach um, and using all of those tools and rotating those tools as a as a method of control. So whatever is available to your farm that's economical, I'm always a big um, preacher of that. Whatever is going to keep your farm um, going another year, we always have to keep that in mind from an economical standpoint. So just making sure you're using all the tools available to you that you have on your farm is is always a good choice. Absolutely. Yeah, some great insight there. The sustainability of that economics wise also key to keep in mind. And I know you mentioned we've got still another year of this research of data collection to get through. So in anticipation of that, I'm sure you have some key things that you're looking forward to seeing most. So what is some of that data that you're hoping plays out? Yeah, so from a cover crop enthusiast like myself, I would like to see basically if we're going to see a decline uh, in viability as time goes on, we would hypothesize that we would see that just because, as I noted before, over time, our natural viability of these palmer amaranth and water hemp populations is going to generally decline. So just taking a look at if we're seeing that over two winters now, if we're still able to see viability changes by that. But also to take a look if we are still seeing these key differences, as I mentioned, two of the seven populations, so Missouri water hemp and Indiana water hemp, if we're seeing some similar increases in viability with those two populations, because if we see that, then we then that furthers our indication that those populations have something unique or special about them in their in their background that's um, reinforcing that. 
So it'll be interesting to see if we continue to see those populations um, go on the similar trends that we've been observing. But also taking a look at dormancy, like I mentioned, to see if we can, if the dormancy has increased or, or decreased at this next removal time and, and what kind of implications that can play for farmers. So, Well, Lily, I'm excited to hear the results of this research, too. We'll definitely have to follow up with you to see how it all plays out here in the near future. But thank you so much for joining us today. And if you have any information for producers, any resources that you particularly like when it comes to cover crops, are there any that you can recommend? Yeah, so just always following uh, the e-update is also is something just that's really important to Kansas agronomy and agriculture. There's so many helpful tools on there. We have a lot of a lot of folks here at Kansas State that are looking at cover crops. So uh, in that aspect, that's always important. But just using your extension resources, reaching out to folks if you have questions. We don't expect everybody to have all the knowledge out there. So just making sure you use the resources online through extension e-updates, your local extension agent, or you can follow me on Twitter at Livin' Like Lil. I always uh, keep up to date on the research that I'm doing and I'm always posting um, if I have a presentation or something coming up on the research activities that I've been conducting. So just making sure you use our extension materials here at Kansas State. A lot of people put a lot of time into putting those together. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And our experts here are so wonderful and so helpful when it comes to cover crops specifically, I feel like is an area our researchers are just excellent in. Well, Lily, I will link to all of those resources because they really are excellent resources that you mentioned, including your Twitter page. That's so fun to include. So thank you so much again for joining us today. Yes, for sure. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Once again, everyone, that was K-State Agronomy Master's student, Lily Wadashevsky, joining us for a conversation on cover crops and those interactions when it comes to weed suppression. We'll be back with more ahead on agriculture today. Culture today. We are joined now by K State Extension Beef Specialist Justin Wagner for a conversation on an upcoming course that will be available to all you stakeholders out there. It's a 30 hour OSHA general industry course. And Justin, before we get into things, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, Samantha. Absolutely. So like I said, it's a 30-hour course that is going to be made available to anyone out there in the feed yard, dairy, or just agricultural industry in general, right? Yeah, that's right. And so this is actually the second year that we've done this in Garden City. And, you know, I had the opportunity to host it. And it was really successful last year when we did it. It was actually one of our first in-person, you know, actual events uh, in the post-COVID era. So I think, you know, we all kind of get excited about those things that went really, really well. And so we had a lot of positive feedback from our feed yards and dairies and just the the ag industry in general uh, out here in response to that course. And so we decided this is definitely something, a little bit of a unique space for K-State Extension to be operating in, but obviously there's a need. And I think one of the things we discovered was that uh, our agriculture industry out here is really looking for some of these opportunities that are accredited, especially for mid-level managers and a number of these different operations and enterprises to get them some additional training into these regulations and and how they can impact their operations. Absolutely. Yeah. Is that really the reasoning behind why you started this in the first place was the ability to get these people accredited, but also to, you know, hopefully impact the way that we're managing our agricultural industry in Kansas? So yes and no. Uh, I think that one of our underlying objectives more broadly is, you know, uh, coming from that industry, the feed yard industry myself in a previous life, uh, you know, safety is just immensely important. We can't underscale the value of providing those opportunities to our employees, but it's also hard to get that training done, right? And so it was creating some opportunities there. And, and I have a colleague uh, who, who used to say that uh, our number one priority should always be to send everyone home each night at the end of the day. And so that's something, uh, uh, many different programs we've, you know, touched on safety and in different aspects. And so this is for me, this is just kind of a, an extension of kind of those thoughts there of, you know, how do we prioritize that and how do we, we create a few more opportunities for the industry out here in general? 
Well, this is a great and extensive opportunity. There's going to be 30 hours worth of safety content delivered through this programming. So when producers are thinking about attending, what can they really expect during those 30 hours? Sure, that, that's a great question. And I, so I think the first thing that, and, and I got the opportunity to sit in the course last year and got my OSHA 30 card. So, um, you know, this is firsthand knowledge. But I think the biggest thing is just that general awareness of those OSHA regulations. Uh, what's in there? What are your responsibilities as an employee? What uh, what are your responsibilities as an employee? So there's there's different aspects to that. I think a lot of times what we forget is that agriculture in general is a high risk occupation. We often don't think about that, but in truth, it, it really is when we look at the data that's out there. So, you know, just gaining a very good, good sense of what those OSHA regulations are, uh, what's in there. And probably most importantly, it's actually how to take the uh, OSHA regulations and look things up. Uh, there's some other activities that we'll do in that course. One of the favorites is, uh, you know, harness training, uh, where we actually get to hoist uh, people up in the harness, show them how to put those harnesses on and, and go through some of those. And then, you know, some other activities that will be involved in there as well would be emergency action plans, putting those together for an operation, you know, thinking through scenarios. What information do you need to retain as an employer? Uh, those are all different aspects that are covered. Obviously, there's a lot as you get into 30 hours that's spread over four days, you know, of kind of in the seat training, if you will. Uh, but there's really a lot of value that comes out of that, that I think uh, even if an operation only has one or two employees that can attend, that they can then bring that information back to the operation. And that's that's really beneficial the spreading of that knowledge through even if it's just a handful of people, like you mentioned, invaluable in this industry to say the least. And you mentioned here that this is taking course over four days. So let's talk through some of those dates and locations and things that are, you know, really important for those that might be interested in attending. Sure. So so what we do with the course is we try to do it in the spring. That seems to be a good time for the industry out here. And so our first meeting this year is going to be March 31. And then we continue with that course essentially every other Friday until May 12 which is our final. So the dates, if you want to put those on your calendar, uh, would be starting March 31, April 14th, April 28th, and then May 12th. And what's also unique about the May 12th meeting is we go through a hands-on. So we actually go into a, a feed yard and participants will learn how to do a safety audit you know, how to walk through the mill, how to look at the different operations in the feed yard and identify some of those hazards, then also come up with a plan. Well, how would you fix this? So registration for those dates uh, is going to be March 24th. There is a cost. Most of that is going to be to cover the materials of the course. So that's a $100. Uh, we do offer a group discount. So if you've got multiple employees, um, we, we try to make that a little more palatable for folks if we can and employers. Uh, we also... Uh, have a sponsor. So Hoovy Pharma is our, our sponsor of the event this year. And so uh, we certainly really appreciate those sponsors because with the instructors that we bring in, uh, they have to be OSHA certified. It's not just anyone can come in and, and do that training. So starts March 31st and the registration is due on March 24th. Uh, that registration is available online, or the easiest way is just to contact me via email at jwagon at ksu.edu, and, and we can certainly get you signed up for that course. Absolutely. And I'll put a link to the sign up in our bio today, which can be found on agtoday.net. So our show notes that we always have additional information linked in, you can find that there. But Justin, you know, you mentioned that the cost is $100 and that, you know, might seem like a lot. But when you think about safety, I said this before, it's an invaluable opportunity. There's so much that can be gleaned from this 30 hour course. So is that your encouragement here is that folks need to sign up as soon as possible? One, because the course size is limited. But two, it's just this is an opportunity to potentially save lives in your own operation. Operation. Oh, absolutely. I, I think it's twofold. I mean, if you have a, an operation, you know, it really doesn't matter whether you have two employees or 25 or 200. Safety is going to be important at all of those levels. And so this is really um, one, a great opportunity for those smaller operations that may not have access to some of these trainings. You know, two, it's, it's also very cost effective. Uh, if you go out and you were to price, you know, a 30 hour OSHA course, it would cost you a lot more than the $100. I can assure you that if, if you wanted to obtain that. And the, you know, really the 
the third benefit is that the employee will receive, if they attend all four of the sessions, they will get their 30 hour OSHA certification card. And so that stays with them for their life. I mean, so they will, as they go down the road, they will actually have that OSHA 30 certification. So that's another good benefit that, uh, you know, I think on both sides of that, both the employer and the employee can say, you know, hey, we, we have had some safety training here. And so maybe that, uh, you know, help spread the word just a little bit. Absolutely. A resume builder of sort. And of course, the flexibility of this course probably isn't offered in other similar courses. K-State's course itself offered over the span of several days because you found that this was feedback you got back and just made it more approachable of an opportunity, right? Yeah. You know, as you look at work schedules and being able to rotate employees off for an entire day, you know, Fridays worked pretty well. And, and then the feedback when we asked employers, especially in the feedlot and dairy industry, they were, they try to rotate off weekends. You know, obviously livestock are kind of a three 365 24 7 enterprise right so being able to schedule that and make that work with you know those typical uh, work schedules in the feed yard and dairy industries really made a lot of sense for us so justin i'm gonna have you repeat those dates again as well as the location this will be taking place at if you don't mind and that's how we'll end today's show all right so 30-hour OSHA certification training will be in Garden City. We'll be starting on March 31, April 14th, April 28th, and ending on May 12th. So four sessions to to get the full 30 hours in. Absolutely. An opportunity those listening will not want to miss out on. So again, be sure to register at the link in our show notes, which can be found on agtoday.net. As always, if you are listening to us on the go, be sure to check that out later on. But Justin, thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing this opportunity with our listeners. Yeah, thanks, Samantha. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Once again, everyone, that was K-State Extension Beef Specialist Justin Wagner joining us for a conversation on the upcoming 30-hour OSHA general industry course. Before we cut to a short break, Scarlett Hagens with the Kansas Livestock Association is also going to share some information on an additional upcoming program available for beef producers through both the Kansas Livestock Association and Kansas State University. Four advanced beef cattle care and health training sessions will be hosted by KLA, the Kansas Beef Council, and Kansas State University Research and Extension during March and April. These checkoff funded sessions will provide beef producers with up-to-date standards and technologies to improve animal welfare and food safety. Dates and locations for the Beef Quality Assurance Workshops are March 28th at the City Limits Convention Center in Colby, March 30th at the Butler County Community and 4-H Building in El Dorado, April 11th at the Stanley Stout Center in Manhattan, and April 13th at the Hilton Garden Inn in Hayes. All the meetings will begin at 6 p.m., During each BQA training, K-State Associate Professor and Extension Beef Veterinarian A.J. Tarpoff will walk through best management practices. Topics will include cattle care, planning for extreme weather, proper low-stress cattle handling methods, and other issues critical to cattle production. Each training will begin with a free dinner sponsored by Certified Angus Beef. During dinner, attendees will hear how CAB is sharing the BQA story and every cattleman's commitment to producing healthy, nutritious, high-quality beef with consumers and the brand's licensed partners. All four BQA workshops are free to attend. To register for one of the seminars, call the KLA office at 785-273-5115. On-site registration also will be available. I'm Scarlett Hagens. We'll be back with more ahead on Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. Along with Samantha Bennett, I'm Jeff Wickman. With the expected arrival of some insect pests this spring, K-State horticultural entomologist Raymond Cloyd says identifying the insect pests, determining whether treatment is necessary, and then seeking a treatment can help reduce the use of pesticides. Raymond, as we start thinking about spring weather, we're also thinking that some of those insects that overwinter may start to emerge in the spring. Yeah, Jeff, there's a number of like ones that overwinter as adults, like squash bugs, everybody's favorite overwinters as adults. And there's a number of other insects that overwinter, like the Asian ladybird beetle is in our homes. And as soon as it's getting warmer, they're going to be wanting to go outside. But yeah, the the uh, ones that overwinter as adults will be the first ones to appear. And so just be aware of that in your vegetable gardens and trees and landscapes. The pest that we're probably going to be looking in the future is eastern tent caterpillar, which is a caterpillar that creates a nest 
uh, in the crotches of trees, primarily those in the uh, rosaceae family, apple, crab apple, those types, cherry and plum. And then the clover mites might start coming in. As soon as the turf grass starts getting greener and greener, and, and if you have turf grass growing around your foundation, that'll allow easy access to clover mites. So you might want to you know, put mulch or rock you know, about two feet away. Don't have the turf grass up against the foundation to alleviate problems with clover mites. Yeah. One of the things we often hear about when we think about insects is using pesticides, and we don't really have to always use pesticides, do we? Absolutely. I mean, we always talk about non-pesticidal means, and there's a number of them. The main one is keeping your plants as healthy as possible through water, fertility, mulching. That'll uh, alleviate problems like wood-boring insects because those are insects that hone in on, quote, unhealthy plants or stress plants, basically. Then there's hand removal uh, or vacuuming, uh, squishing. You know, those are methods that you can use. So before you go ahead and go to the garden center or pick up a pesticide, make sure you pick up the right one. Think of some non-pesticidal means of dealing with insect pests, you know, mulching plants, pruning dead, diseased, and dying branches out. And we have extension publications and we have extension individuals in our department that can help you deal with that. And that just isn't for insects and mites, but also for diseases, too. There's also oils and soaps and things like that, too, right? Yeah, oils and soaps are, my first one is always a forceful or high-pressure water spray to dislodge soft-bodied insects like aphids and mites. That works wonders, and they don't come back safe to humans, safe to the environment, then soaps are desiccants, insecticidal soaps. And that is the EPA-registered ones, which have the active ingredient potassium salts of fatty acids. Do not, I repeat, do not use dish soaps, joy, palm olive. Those are not pesticides, and they can actually burn your plants. And then oils, mineral oils, neem-based oils, those are suffocants. They block the breathing pores, which we call in entomology spiracles, and the insects might die of asphyxiation. So those we call alternative selective materials. However, let me state, those materials will kill beneficial insects and they will kill bees on contact. So you don't want to spray when bees are active. They just don't last as long. They're contact only, but they're non-discriminatory. They'll kill whatever they... If you spray a green lacewing, a ladybug, or a honeybee with them, with an oil of soap, you will kill them. What I'm hearing you say is know what insects you're going after and then use the right treatment. Exactly. We always recommend, number one, proper correct identification of the designated pest. Make sure it's even a pest. Make sure it's a substantial pest. There are certain pests that may be out there, but they're not going to cause substantial or significant plant damage. So get it identified. You can send samples into our department And then that will allow you to select the appropriate insecticide or miticide, basically, depending on what type of pest. Because not all insects or mites are on the labels of pesticides. That's why you read the label. The label is a law. So that's just the steps you need to ensure. And then when you make your applications, there are three mantras. One is thorough coverage of all plant parts, especially leaf undersides, because that's where most insects and mites are at. Then there's frequency of application. How often do you spray? And you get that information off the label. And then you want to spray when the vulnerable life stages are there. And most of the vulnerable life stages are the larva, nymph, and adults. And so that's really important to maximize the effectiveness. And so if you get really high mortality, you don't have to spray as often. And that's what you want to do. That's K-State horticultural entomologist Ray McCloyd with information on ways to reduce the use of pesticides to treat early season insect pests. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Samantha Bennett, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.